chapter 4, verse 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Mark 4, 16. We are in the summer months. There is sweat. Lots of it. Camp's been great. We've had two weeks already of camp. We've already had over uh, 300-something kids in two weeks. That's a lot of meals, ropes, core, swimming, a lot of fun, a lot of sunshine, a lot of sunshine. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. You found it? Okay, if you haven't found it by now, you're not going to, so would you stand with me? Amen. Just, this almost is hard for me, for me to say. I almost want to just kind of throw up when I'm saying it, but I'm going to. <coughs> Congratulations to Oklahoma Boomer Sooners <coughs> for winning <laughs> girls softball. I got to tell you something. If you've not seen the interview of those four girls on that team, look it up talking about the difference in happy and joy. Uh, you, I don't care if you're a Baylor fan, Bama fan, Aggie fan, you got to give kudos to Oklahoma Boomer Sooners. I'm telling you, them girls played some soft ball now. And they, and they kept the joy alive, and they talked. This is three times they won it, but they talked about whenever they lost, how they lost their happiness. And the coach taught them happy comes from happenings, but joy comes from the Lord. And they held on to that, and they grasped it, and, and it, it, it began to understand you're contagious. You are either going to, people are going to contact negativity from you or positivity. Amen. And their Jesus got real big, and they handled the pressure of it. And to listen to them girls testify, and I hope you get to hear it. Amen. It was an amazing feat. So I've never been for that school, but i got to say kudos to them. Amen. you got to recognize it when you see it. And thank God that, you, that Jesus has been. And listen, what a lightning rod to be a coach of a national uh, team that won, and you love Jesus, you can imagine the liberal pressure on her, the pressure for her to say the, don't you say about Jesus, and she just talked Jesus. <laughs> talking Jesus, I love it. Well, speaking of Jesus, he was about 12 years old when he entered into the temple. When he got in there, he opened the scrolls, and he rolled open to the book of Isaiah, and he said, as he went there, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, and his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed him, unrolling, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When I read this, it's clear to me that Jesus came to, and I, and I put these in B's just to help you understand it, that which needs to be restored, that they're bankrupt. If you've lost your fortune, if you lost your finances, if you lost something, Jesus came to help restore that which is bankrupt. He came to those that had a heart that was broken. You cannot live in this life long enough. Eventually, your heart will get broken. He came to restore broken hearts. We've often talked about a broken heart needs a hug, not a talk. You don't talk to people whose hearts that are broke. You hug them, you hold them, you touch them. Uh, to the bankrupt, of course, you've you got to talk to them. You've got to help them understand that. Then he also came to those that are bound, those that have addictions. You can take somebody with an addiction. You can lock them up. You can put a straitjacket on them. But until their mind changes, until there's a shift here, they'll always be addicted. Words matter to them, how they, what they learn to say, how they learn to think. Amen. And then the blind. And I want to mention this because I'd never seen this before. He said, I came to recover sight to the blind. To recover sight means you once had sight. You once could see, but now you can't see. He said, I want you to see. What happened in life is a lot of people have lost their vision. They've lost vision. They've lost the future. They, they, they're sad. Everything's broken down. Jesus said, I came to restore your vision, your sight, to recover it, for you to get it back, and to restore that which has been blind, and to the bruised, that was his mandate. Father, I thank you for the word of God. Anoint my lips to share it, our hearts to grasp, to get hold of it. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. God bless you. you. may be seated. To restore, that's what he came to do, which means to relocate that which was dislocated to give back the former condition of health. I've often said the word restore means to get your store back, to get that which you lost. You know, what do you think of when you hear the word restore? 
What, how does it affect you? How long, first off, how long does it take? Now, I, I, I washed my old car yesterday. It's a 1971 Challenger. And when I washed that car, I thought, that car has been restored. To restore something depends on how rusty it is, how broken down it is, how messed up it is. Now, I know God can do a quick work, but I've met some people that are pretty rusty, broken down, and disgusted and need a lot of help. Can I get an amen? So it may take a little while. How much damage is done? Is it a small ding? Rusted through. Is the frame bent and in need of straightening? Amen. I took auto body in high school. I know that some cars didn't take a whole lot. I, I took my Dodge Charger when I was 16 years old. I went through a woman's yard. Didn't mean to. I just slid sideways, low back tire. And, uh, and this, is, this is so funny that when I went around, every time I get up on the mountain where I'm from in Alabama, I, I go around this curve. I think about it. This was one of them ladies that was a, uh, a crotchety old Baptist woman. Now, again, my family were bootleggers, all right? So I'm going around this curve with my brother, and uh, he's, uh, he's sitting. He's one year difference than me, and he's sitting next to me. Now, we never wore seatbelts. There were no airbags in them cars. Went around that curve, and I got that Hearst shifter. And I shifted. I'm, I'm drinking a cup of coffee. There's no drink holders in those cars. You realize them cars had no drink holders? They didn't want you drinking in them. They had a cigarette lighter, but didn't have no drink holders. <laughs> so I'm going around the curve, and that car hit sideways. I'm running late for school, and she has these shrubberies that went all the way down in front of her house, real pretty, and had this big old bird bath right in the front driveway like that. Well, as I'm going around the curve, I can actually see the bird bath coming as my car is shifting sideways. I hand the coffee to my brother. This is in the day before the Yeti. You didn't have a cover on your coffee cup. You poured, so you drunk it down before you got it. So I handed him the coffee. I'm, I'm 16 now. I'm sliding around the curve. I'm downshifting. I'm hitting them trees, all her shrubs. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. I, I, I come down, and I got a moment here. I go back in the first. I shift it, and I come out, spin out, and head on to school. He hands me my coffee back, and I, get, and, uh, I get to school on time. My father received a phone call that evening. <laughs> that a green Dodge Charger, F8 Green, had gone through this woman's yard. She was looking for restoration. Uh <clears throat> And she told my dad, this is funny, she said, well, it's going to cost you this much for me not to report him and get him uh, in trouble. And uh, so you could either pay it or go to church. I told you she's Baptist, right? <clears throat> my dad paid it. <laughs> hey, some things ain't worth going to church for. Can I get an amen? When I was a kid, that was one of the things that wasn't worth going to church for. Fix the car. I went. I had auto body, so I mean, I fit my. I mean, I took the rear quarter panel out. And I say, so if you saw that car before I traded it for a Gremlin, which is the worst thing I ever done in my life, I, I it had a Bondo and Primer on the back end of it, and it wasn't. But three weeks later, my cousin Jody Marshall went through that same yard in his Monte Carlo, <laughs> and he took that bird bath clean out. That's another story. That's because she was so mean. You don't have to be mean if you're Baptist. Hello? You don't even have to be Baptist. Can I get an amen? Restored. What does it mean to you? Restoring the right is the mission of the church. It's what Jesus did to countless people he met. Everything, when Jesus met people, he was restoring them. He restored a diseased woman, giving her the right to be whole again. Amen. He restored David's soul in Psalm 23. He restored the right to peace for the demoniac of the Gadarean, who was sitting there dressed, and the Bible says, in his right mind. Jesus restored Peter's right to believe for the impossible, and he became a wave walker. He restored the the Syrophoenician woman's right to hound him, to go after him, to say, my daughter needs healing. Amen. And she wouldn't leave him alone. And she barked at him until her daughter was healed. He restored Lazarus' right to life. He restored Peter after his actions denied him three times and gave him the right to preach. Jesus is the restorer of everything that's ever left your life. Can I get an amen? He said, I came that you may have sight. I came that you may be blessed and your heart would not be broken no more. But I find it most church 
churches just uncover the wound. They prejudge what they perceive as wrong, broke, sinful, well, that which is bankrupt, brokenhearted, bound, blind, or bruised, what is useless, usually noticeable to everyone, and leave them wounded enough to take years for them to heal. Now, I bring that up for a reason because oftentimes our problem is not racism as more, much as it is prejudice. To pre prejudice is to prejudge. I wore this shirt today because it bothers people. It's got a skull on it, and it just seems to affect people. Now, it affects church folk a lot worse than it does regular sinners. Regular sinners, I can wear this shirt, and they come walking right up to me. They think I'm one of them. I'm just a lion in, in uh, wolf's clothing. Amen? You know, it's just, it's just a different way of thinking. It's the way I think. So, so, but prejudice, to prejudge, uh, is the highest form of ignorance, to judge before a trial. To see somebody like Frank over there with a beard and a ponytail and not realize what a gentle soul he is. We, we judge people immediately when we see them, you know, with tats on them or, or, or handicaps. Uh, I was watching, and, and I say this with all sweetness, and I, I love Benaya, but if you don't know who this little boy is, amen, you, you mess up, you prejudge him. You think to yourself, this, this little boy's out of control. He's not out of control. That's who he is. Amen. Now, Josh, needs whooping, but Benaiah, <laughs> that's who he is. Amen. He, he, he's, he's got autism, and because of that, when you understand that, you're able to talk to him. You, you, we got these prejudices that come out. My sister had, uh, was handicapped. She, had, she, had, uh, uh, she was born with muscular dystrophy and a touch of cerebral palsy. She had a mind of an 8-year-old in a 30-year-old in a body. Amen. And so you would prejudge her and say stuff about her. So when oftentimes when Jesus, he saw a leper, he saw somebody that was blind or maimed or handicapped, he, he touched them. He blessed them. He healed them. He did stuff for them. If you saw a leper, you ran from lepers. Amen. A leper would show up. You was afraid what they had was going to get on you. Amen. That's so everybody, that's what we were told during COVID. You get near somebody. Amen. It's going to get on you. I never believed it. I've never acted like it. Amen. I, I just, I can't do it. I can't do it. I got to believe that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So I stand and I believe the word of God over everything else even any government would say. So I, I believe when Jesus went to lepers, he touched them and it blew people away. He healed them. He gave them back things. He took away the prejudice, amen, that everybody else saw. Listen, whoever you can classify, you can cancel. If you can classify them in life, you can just cancel them, get them out of the way. When someone thinks they know you, they will ignore you. Let me tell you something. Katie and Johnny, that's my daughter and son. They don't know me. They know me, but they don't know me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? My wife don't even realize who sometimes who I am. Can you get an amen? Amen. We, but here's the thing. If you think you know me, you won't listen to me. Jesus goes to, the, to the, uh, a well. A woman was there, a, 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 a Samaritan woman, been married five times. Man, she was with what, her husband. When he got there, Jesus said, if you knew who I was. Well, all she thought was, you're a, 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 you're a prejudiced Jew who hates Samaritans. I know who you are. And he said, woman, if you only knew who I was. Amen. You, you would understand. You would receive life. Her prejudice made her ignore him. She ignored him. And oftentimes, that's what prejudice does in our life. Amen. Uh, you know, when you destroy the ignorance of prejudice, you'll create a hunger and thirst for life. But you got to destroy that prejudice to quit judging people immediately as you see them and when you see them. Get to know them the best you can. When I say you don't know me, I know you know me, but everybody understands that they, we never... How would I say it? Well, I'm going to leave that alone. I, I get in trouble. <laughs> Jesus restored lepers, giving them not just their appendages back, but he gave them their right to self-esteem. He told them, go show yourself to the priest. Enter back into society. When you get your store back, it's a powerful thing. I want to talk to you about withered hand and withered hearts here. Jesus upset their religion. He upset everything was, that was going on because the moment he walked in, the people realized he's not just an ordinary man. He's just not just another good teacher. There's something radically different about this Nazarene. 
You know, he's the one that snaps his fingers and blind eyes open. This is the one who speaks to the dead and they come to life. This is the one that touches the tongue of the dumb and the man begins to speak. This is the one that instantly heals open sores of lepers by the power of Almighty God. Hallelujah. This is the sea walker, the blind man healer, the leper cleanser from Galilee. This is the one, and he's still the one. So we find him in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 says, Another time he went into the synagogue, a church, and a man with a shriveled right hand was there, and some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Who was doing that? That's the preachers, the Pharisees. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Oh, my goodness. Religion is so narrow. It's so narrow. Pastor Joseph was talking to me this week, and he said, Pastor, when I first came here, my life was so narrow. I was raised in Church of Christ and Baptist and stuff. He said, but my eyes have opened since I've been with the little country church. I'm seeing that religion was bondage. Amen. It doesn't mean that you go off and boomerang over to the sinful world, but, but it's been bondage to, to have lived that way. Amen. So here we read, it's the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, you know, the Sabbath, you can't work. The Sabbath, you, you can't do anything. So here on the Sabbath, Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or kill? But they remained silent. It, you see, it was a catch-22 for them. And he looked around at them in anger. You ever see Jesus get mad? He's angry and deeply distressed at their stubborn, callous hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and this man was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they may kill Jesus. Now, Pharisees and Herodians are like Republicans and Democrats. They don't get along. But on this matter, we both going to get along. We're going to decide how to kill Jesus because Herodians didn't believe in life after death. Pharisees did. So, but we're going to get together. We're going to kill Jesus. We're going to bring him out. Matthew, it's funny how Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the same thing. Little variable here. Matthew said, going on from that place, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They asked him, is it lawful to do this on the Sabbath? <coughs> He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched out and was completely, everybody say restored. Just as sound as the other. And the Pharisees went out and plotted how they may kill Jesus. Jesus, in essence, said, you hypocrites, you deranged hypocrites, you'd get a sheep out of a hole, but you'd let a man with a withered hand go through life like that. And isn't that where our society is today? Placing more importance, perhaps, on an animal than on a human being, on a spotted owl, on a lizard, uh, but not a baby? Have we, we lost our, our minds. We, we, listen, I love animals. I, I don't know anybody that loves dogs more than me. Now, there's other things I don't like. <sighs> Y'all know about my cat thing. I don't like cats. Amen. I got, I got rat traps on my motorcycles and on my car, so pop them cats when they jump up there. They're not my cats. I'll deal with that more later. I got a BB gun in my house, not a pellet. Just want to hit them in the butt, send them home. Get out of here. But dogs, I love dogs. Love them. Got a stray dog. Trained it up. Gave, it's my wife's dog. Got big Coda. Comes in during the rain. 130 pound. I'll eat you up. Comes in the house. <sighs> puppy. He's just a puppy. But let me tell you something. Without me, them dogs ain't living. Without me, them dogs don't get fed. Without me, them dogs don't get water. Without me, them dogs don't see my vet. Without me. You're more important than a sheep. You're more important than an animal. Amen. God made you. The reason you got to stay well is to take care of animals. Can I get an amen? So, so, but we got this thing backwards. We flip it. We got this uh, PETA thing working where people, what's that? People enjoying tasty animals or something like that. I forget what it's called. I mean, Peter. But, but anyway, it, they all about all that, but they forget how important humans are. Can you get an amen? So to restore the right, Luke chapter 6, verse 6 says, and I mentioned this already, well, on another Sabbath, he went to the synagogue and was teaching. The man was there. His right hand was shriveled. Now that matters because your right hand has to do with blessing. When every time they blessed, 
You took your right hand. You always extended your right hand. I don't care if you were left-hand dominant. You always extended your right hand to bless people. You put it on their head. You prayed over them. We still do that today in the house. Amen. A hand of ministry. This is a hand of ministry. It's a hand of power. Amen. Jesus sitting at the right hand. Never says left hand. Always the right hand of God. Amen. That's where he sits. Amen. It's the hand of receiving. When somebody hands me something, it's often into this right hand that people will help give Give money here or blessings here. Oftentimes, I give back with this hand. I remember throwing a set of truck keys to my son-in-law after he married my daughter. It took all that to get him to marry her. Amen. I threw him a set of truck keys. Amen. But it was important that he receive And he didn't throw that left hand up to catch it. He caught it with the right hand. Amen. It's the hand of fellowship. When I shake hands with someone, it's my right hand that comes in. It's a little awkward to do this. I do it every now and then, but I always feel a little effeminate. Amen. So it's always important to stick this hand out and give you a good handshake. Can I get an Amen. But none of this can be done if it's withered. None of that can happen if it's drawn back. And so spiritually speaking, I've seen people lose ministry. They've lost fellowship. They've lost receiving. Amen. Their hands withered back. They can't give you a hug. They can't reach out. And God came to restore us. He wants us well. He wants us whole. Let me tell you, besides being a, a physical handicap, that old withered, shriveled up hand is a type of mankind. In spite of our education, ability, talents, all our 6,000 years of development, we're still a withered creation because of the fall. We keep falling back into it. What causes a withered hand? Neglect of use. If you don't use it, you lose it. The Message Bible, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 11 says, at that time, discipline isn't much fun. Dis Let me just say, that discipline ain't fun at all. Bible trying to give you a little leeway, a little bit of fun, but it, it says here it isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely, for it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. So don't sit around on your hands, no more dragging your feet. Clear the path for long-distance runners so no one will trip and fall, so no one will step in a hole and sprain their ankle. Help each other out. Run for it. It, it's, it's so important you to know that I get up in the morning and I make myself get up. I'll force myself out of bed. It ain't been because I'm 62. When I was a youth pastor, I played basketball. I, 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 I coached basketball. I would get out on the court with them kids. I, and, and every morning after that, I literally, and this is the truth, I'd crawl out of bed. Most of you know I was born with a muscular dystrophy. I've had four surgeries. I, I got a little limp to me. I'd get out of bed on hands and knees to the restroom because I couldn't walk. I, it took a while to straighten everything out, get everything working again. But here's the fact. If I'd have stayed in bed, I'd never got up. You got to get up. You got to use it. You got to use your faith. You got to believe God for things. You got to use your prayer life. You got to get the Word of God in you. You got to share the Word of God with other people. You got to exercise your faith. But you need to also exercise your body some. Your body needs some help. There's a certain danger in inactivity. The results of it can be devastating. Doctors now concede that early on polio victims, my mother was thought to have polio when she was little and passed on to us. Polio don't pass on through generations, but the, the muscular dystrophy she had passed on to us kids. So that affected us, but they thought she had polio, and they put braces on her when she was little, and they tried to make her stay down and keep her down. Now they have found and it was bad advice when they were told to stay off the, a diseased leg. It turned out to encourage deterioration. They changed their vocabulary from get off your feet to get on your feet. Start using what has, what was, what has the disease, for as you use it, you'll be healed. Oftentimes, you can walk yourself into healing. You can get yourself better. But you got to do something. And discipline ain't fun. And it, I don't like it. Amen. I, I get walking. I work out with weights. I, I stretch. I gripe. I complain. I come home. Everybody says, like, how was your workout? I hated it. Let me be straight up with you. I hated it. I hate that there are young people all around me that are faster, working out better, going longer, and I got to learn to stay in my lane. I got to say to myself, self. This is as good as you can do right now. But at least you're here. At least you're working on something. You ain't never going to get them, them abs back. 
but you'll always have a cool keg. So what destroys it? When you don't use it. Second thing to destroy or make a hand with it is a crushing wound. Everybody here is going to have a time when you're going to get a crushing wound. Something's going to crush you. The passing of a loved one. It can be the death of an animal. It can be a devastating relationship. It could be financial. It could be part of the bound, the blind, addictions, things of that nature. Something happened. Proverbs 18, 14 says, the human spirit can endure in sickness, and we can handle sickness. We go through it. But a crushing wound, a crushed spirit, who can bear? Even David said in Psalm 51, he said, Lord, let these bones you have crushed rejoice again. Amen. Help me to rejoice one more time. Oftentimes, we get beat up. Things happen in life, and it crushes our spirit. It just Your spirit is your... your uh, animation it's that lively part of you it's that coming alive it's it's about the only thing i like about keith sanders you know it's that animation so luke 4 18 says he came to heal the brokenhearted he heals the broken hearts amen he gives them back their their this their spice for life again he meant that excitement again withered heart and here being grieved being grieved it says because of their hardness of heart. Their hearts were not broken. Their heart was hard. Their heart had calloused. Their, their, their heart had atrophied. Amen. He looked at these spiritual leaders, and he saw them with their heart the way it was, and he was deeply distressed over that. Hebrews tells us in chapter 3, verse 12, Take heed, brothers, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You once knew God, but now you've departed. It's worse than just backsliding. You, you've departed from the living faith. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? You understand your heart is the seat of your emotions. It's not just this, but don't, but don't, but don't. It's the seat of your emotions. Your heart's connected to your ear. Amen. What you hear. Amen. And that helps you what you, you speak from that. From the heart, the mouth speaks. I've often said this over and over, your tongue's a dipstick to your heart. If I pull your tongue out, I'd know if you were a quart low. Because this is where it's at. I hear you talk. I hear you negativity. I hear you pessimistic. I hear you unbelief. It comes out of here because it's going, gone down into here. So where your, where your treasure is, huh? Let me read it again. But where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So wherever I put my treasures in life, there my heart goes. You know, I talked about that old car I got uh, and my Harleys and stuff, but they're not treasures. They, they can only be hooks in life to reach people. If they become treasures in my life, my heart's always with them. I'd never come to church where your treasure is. That's why I, I get nervous when people put their treasure in other things other than Jesus. Amen. If my heart's in Christ, amen, it's in the church. It's, it's here. But we have such lame excuses, don't we? I hear lame excuses all the time. It's my only morning to sleep, Pastor. It's my only morning to sleep. Sunday morning, your only morning to sleep. Well, I can sleep in on Saturday, but I go fishing. I worship God in the outdoors. That's why I only wait till deer season. And then I'm worshiping God. Well, where were you the other eight months? Well, I was preparing for deer season. The sermons are too long. Not in early service. <laughs> Church people are so judgmental. <laughs> Don't you love that? I'm just not being fed. You're not here to be fed. You're here to be equipped. You're here to go out and, and share this gospel that you've heard. You're not here. Somebody, well, I just want to be fed. If I don't laugh in church, if I don't take some notes, if I don't, if, if I don't get any revelation, I'm not being fed. You, your, your place is not being fed. It's about being equipped. I'm here to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Amen. You've got to go out and do the work. Thank you. Uh, t t you know, 10 years ago, Pastor, 10 years ago at some church somewhere, I, they were awful, awful to me. Whoa. They were offering you at Walmart, and you keep going back. I feel like I need to get right with God before I can come to church. Ain't going to happen. 
I ain't going to happen. If I get, I, I, that was a mentality of us back when I was a kid. We got to get right. We got to get the right clothes. I hear people say, I got to get the right clothes before I come to church. Oh, we took that uh, excuse away. Hey, Amen. We're just glad to see you clothes. <laughs> but that's what people think that before I can come, it, it, it's never going to happen, so you might as well just come on in. Churches just want my money. No, they don't. God wants your money. Because God says where your treasure is, your heart is. And if you don't put your treasure, you don't learn to tithe and, and, and be blessing in the house of God, then, then money owns you. And now you're letting something evil on you. When I cut my tithe, when I, when, I, when I bless the Lord with my offering, amen, I remind myself my treasure is in the house of God. Amen. My investment is in the house of God. And so, church, the, the band is too loud. <laughs> you laughing, Mary? They go too long. Sing too much. We want to hear the other one. I'm so glad y'all ain't this way. I'm talking about other churches. This is, none of these excuses apply to any of y'all. <laughs> Maybe to some watching online, but none of y'all. The church is full of hypocrites. We can always use one more. <laughs> it's too hot. It's too cold. I've heard it all before. I've been with you 20 years here. Surely you have heard it all before. And how about COVID? That's still a thing, right? So COVID, I'm not going to church because it's COVID. We got so many excuses. Let's get this close. Healing that hand. Healing that hand. Did you know the man never asked to be healed? He never said, hey, left hand up. Look at me here. They wanted, it was, a, it's, it, sometimes I read it, it's like it was a setup. They knew the man was in the building. They knew Jesus has a compassionate heart. They knew if they waved a little bait, a little scandal on in front of him, he would have to bite for it. They knew if he healed on the Sabbath, they had him for breaking the law of the Old Testament. They knew it. What they didn't know was, oh, he was God's son, healer. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful in the Sabbath? To do good or do evil, to save life or to kill? They remained silent. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was completely restored. I read one commentary that believed that this man was a stonemason, which would apply to the crushing wound, but it also took away all the economy they had. The scripture says that Jesus got angry. Another translation said he snorted in anger. Sh snorted like a bull. Fitting to take you on. Snorted. Anger is not wrong if it's kept in check. And at times, not to be angry is wrong. Let me say it again. Not to be angry is wrong. One of the problems we have in this Christian world today is that nothing angers us anymore. Nothing upsets our apple cart anymore. Nothing, at least not the right things, Oh, a car breaking down, or a neighbor's cat. That'd make us angry. But what about right things? We see evil. We see people going to hell by the millions. We see Satan wrecking havoc all around us, and we sit idly by. We've become so desensitized to sin that it's no wonder we're in this pitiful condition we're in as a nation and as a world. We need to get angry. We need to allow our anger. Be angry, but sin not. Don't, don't allow yourself to fall into sin, but be angry. I'm angry you guys would try to set me up. This is Jesus, so you try to set me up. Or you'll pull a sheep out. You care more for an animal than you do this man. Stand up, sir. Stretch out your hand. <sighs> and that hand that was withered, that stomp that was unusable, piece of flesh 
Jesus stretched it out, stood in front of everyone, stretched it out. Now this man is able to receive blessing and ministry, power, receive it, fellowship. He relocated that which was dislocated, and they got angry at him. Why would you ever get angry at somebody that got their stuff back, got their life back? Oh, I, I used to like them when they were drunks, stupid, and acting up in relationships. Now they, they married, they settled, they got kids, they're going to church. They're driving Dodges. Their lives are so good now. Restored. Why would you be angry? Stubborn hearts. Father, deal with our hearts. Take away the callousness. Let us prepare ourselves for miracles. Let us believe you for great things. Let us exercise our faith. Let our hands that have been withered back and refused fellowship. Amen. If I'm talking to you this morning, stretch out your right hand right now. Amen. Just stretch that right hand toward heaven. Father, we thank you for restoring our right to ministry. We have a right to preach the gospel, to share the gospel with our neighbors and family around us. We have a right for ministry right now, God. We thank you, Lord, for receiving. If you feel like you've not received from God, stretch your hand right now. Stretch that right hand out toward heaven. Amen. God, I want to receive from you. I've been praying. The heavens feel like brass. I believe I'm going to get through in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for healing this hand. Stretch that hand out right now. God, I want to receive back from you the blind, the blind recovery of sight again. Give me vision for my future, for my kids, for my grandkids. God, let me have vision again. Recover my sight. God, I stretch forth my hand. I'm believing for the impossible. God, I don't care if it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the days are made for man, not man. But, but that's what you created the Sabbath for. So I thank you for the Sabbath. I thank you for us. Thank you for this house. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 No more lame excuses. No more lame excuses. When I hurt, I want to get in the house. When I'm good, I want to be in the house. My hope comes from Him. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and staff, they comfort me. He makes a picnic in front of all my enemies. He blesses me in spite of everybody that didn't like me. Their hearts may be hardened, but God keeps on blessing me. Mm. I think I've lived that story. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give God one more praise. Hallelujah. Where your treasure is, your heart is. It's not, it, it, listen, it's not just this. You can have your treasure in an RV. You can have your treasure in a person, in a thing. But man, I, I've always want to keep my heart toward him. So my, my treasures come here. Amen. To the house, toward people. My treasures in people. Amen. I, I, I put my treasure in people. They're, they're people I believe in. Amen. Uh, so I think it's very important for us to understand that tithing is not a religious thing. A giving is not a religious thing. It, it's a way to keep me connected to the covenant of God and keep me connected to Him. And, and yes, it blesses. I'm able to keep guys on staff, women on staff. You know, I, I'm so blessed to hear how Forge is doing, our youth. Uh, 35 kids last Monday night out here in the park. Sis, you know, y'all had a big crowd in here on Friday night, starting up here, the ladies being blessed. We're seeing things start to be restored getting our stuff back amen and it's a beautiful thing can I get an amen amen how long will it take well how dent it is the car how rusty is the car some of us may take a little while amen need a little extra paint hallelujah if I get our servant leaders to come y'all keep praying 
for the North Campus, all right, that they can become as spiritual as y'all. Pray for them. They need your help. You tie the offering envelopes on the back of that pew. You can go to your phone and give. Amen. Holywild.net slash give. Over 60% of our income now is coming through our phones. Amen. Coming online. So I kind of back off and say, Lord, whatever, whatever you want to do. Amen. Bless the house. This week, Tuesday morning, 830, ropes course. We're going to throw a rocking horse daycare. A bunch of screaming little daycare kids off the ropes course. It is so fun. You need to come and just hear kids scream. If you come, we'll throw you off the tower too. Oh, and we'll help you. Amen. For those that are guests here, we've got a 40-foot tower that we use to bless others with. But that's Tuesday, Thursday at 830. And then on Saturday, we're going to do it again at 830. Amen. we got the people from the Guadalupe or something showing up. Or be interesting. You never know what kind of camp you're going to get. It's always interesting. So as we give today, we're believing God for more money. Sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, and success to the kingdom. Amen. Everybody stretch that right hand out. Believe in God for the best this week. Amen. I believe in God for the best, and I'm accepting the verdict. Whatever that, if that verdict is a blessing, I want it. If it's not, God, I'm going to accept your will. But I'm believing you for the best in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor David.